right now what we're doing is providing workshops for focus and attention for people with ADHD. So in the UK on the National Health Service, the waiting lists to get assessed for ADHD are insanely long. And so uh, we've been working with a company called Practical Wisdom, who are basically trying to provide solutions for people. If you if you're on the waiting list, then actually you're not getting the diagnosis, which means you can't get the medication, then they need to look for other ways to improve like uh, other strategies to improve your focus and so that's at the moment that's our our main thing that we're doing uh we also partnered up with a company called jack uh just ask any question and their whole thing is like they they're trying to become the google search engine for mental health um and it's quite a cool website so like when you when you go onto it, you can type in your questions and it's just video responses, but uh, they've kind of laid it out in a way that you kind of feel like somebody's talking to you. So uh, those are our two big things. And then rather than doing those sort of online memberships and stuff that we were doing, then we just work with people um, privately. So um, pretty busy, but uh, yeah, slightly different to before. Yeah, that's uh, that's cool. Um, I imagine that you, it was kind of already in your wheelhouse, but have you had to like adjust the way that you are teaching um, the the kind of focus and attention stuff, the ADHD stuff, to kind of match that population? Because uh, I don't know if you were working necessarily with like ADHD clients before. Has there been kind of like any unique challenges in, in working with some of those people? So we were, but the big challenge, like the biggest challenge that showed up was we're starting to work with people who didn't necessarily sign up because they wanted to work with us. So like before, if you, if you're going to sign up to our membership, then, uh, you know, you probably followed our Instagram, you heard a podcast, and then you went, oh, that's interesting, I need to learn more. And uh, usually by the time somebody, you know, if somebody comes to work with me in person, almost always, we've had a call together, or, we, you know, they kind of know what to expect. And so they're already, you know, they've had the chance to go, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's the kind of thing I want to work with. Um or they go like, oh, yeah, this is so cool. This is different to what I was expecting. So uh, I really want to jump ahead with this. And um, when you're dealing with people who actually don't know what they're getting, like, again, the courses that we were running at the moment were people on a waiting list. So they were signed up for like specifically they signed up for something else. Uh, and while they're waiting for that, it's like, Oh, well, what about these other, other strategies for focus and attention? So the interesting part for me is to be, to be, well, how do you explain it even simpler? Cause that was always the big challenge for myself and Gareth. When we started out, we kind of knew what we were, we were talking about in our own heads and when we spoke to each other, but we didn't really know, uh how to explain it well to other people and so we had to do a lot of work to figure out how to how to do that to people who are maybe thinking on our level but then now we're going beyond that where it's like ah well i i specifically signed up because i want medication because i know medication helps with focus what do you mean the way that I breathe might influence my focus. What do you mean that uh, I can do stuff with my eyes? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we've been trying to, you know, come up with, well, how do you explain it? And uh, I try to think of physical examples. So, you know, if you have uh, an ACL tear, some people get surgery, uh, which we can say if instead of an ACL tear, you're lacking your focus. Well, you might get surgery, which could be the same as getting a medication where it's just an intervention from somebody else that kind of solves the problem, but not everybody gets surgery. Sometimes it's inappropriate. Sometimes it's, uh, 
just not right for for that individual so then you got to figure out all right well what other things can i do to make sure i can still move my knee and usually in that case it's making the muscle surrounding it so immensely strong that uh that now your knee can tolerate a lot more movement and a lot more instability just because you've got much bigger stronger muscles rather than the uh the extra ligament that that you might want um and we're trying to do a similar thing with with focus so we're trying to figure out when you need to focus if if we know that you already struggle with focus and that's not working well well what other things does your body need like it needs to have more oxygen going to your brain and um, there are certain postures and certain things that your eyes do when you focus you know people tend to uh, blink less often when they're when they're focusing they tend to move their eyes uh, a little more deliberately so their eyes will either stay fixed on one point or uh, they'll move to exactly what they want to see whereas when you're when you're kind of letting your mind go everywhere your eyes sort of just feel free to jump over here jump over here um so we're trying to relay that message across that we're trying to figure out what are all the physical processes that mean when you do need to focus the one thing that you struggle with uh that you're actually not terrible at it if that makes sense yeah if you were to prescribe or define there being like a deficit pre-ingrained in the effort most people use to alleviate focus issues say it's coffee say it's uh, an energy drink say it's uh, an interbulating environment so it's just like by nature they they like sit and chill at like a really high paced high frenetic uh, uh, wavelength what is the consequence of doing that as opposed to figuring out the actual solutions to it if you spent 10 years living in in some degree of justified sympathetics or consuming something that uh, puts you in that sympathetic state what do you say is the the consequence of doing that well i guess the the simple answer is focus is just one one level on the pyramid of of stress so if if you're like oh i can do i can you know take an energy drink and that will help me focus um it the reason it helps you focus is it gets you from the state of being super tired or in a more like your body's trying to put you in a more parasympathetic state because it said you didn't sleep well last night you didn't do all the things that you were you were supposed to do so i want you to still be resting and you take the energy drink basically going ah well screw you i'm going to focus again now um so that's going to put it just basically stimulates you more which any stimulation we can also say is just another version of stress um and then it becomes the same as if you put yourself in a high stress situation for for a really long period of time so uh focus i guess just like stress should be something that you know you focus when you need to and uh and then when you don't need to focus actually focus isn't a good idea so so like the reason our brain goes from the the hyper focus you know don't pay attention to your surroundings uh and then has also has an option to to just be like oh i'm just gonna chill and like see what's around me is that's how how it should be done to survive you know you if you're hyper focused on one thing um and you cannot unfocus yourself then you need to hyper focus on every little thing in the environment in order to to know what's around you uh and you know so if you take it into the wild that's the tiger that you don't see or whatever because you have to look at every single leaf to to figure out if there was a tiger there versus being able to just re rest and relax and chill out and use your peripheral vision and and just sort of spot oh something weird's going on over there okay i'll go into my hyper focus mode and uh and look at that for a little bit um and i guess yeah when you're when you're using a tool so like energy drinks um even you know like people use amphetamines and stuff as as medication to to help them focus but that can also have the effect if uh if you're misusing that especially uh, but even if you're using it for what what you want is that um you might find that now you are forced to focus because you're it how it's done that is it's raised your stress level up just a little bit so that it's like all right now you can be in this hyper focused state but then you might find you can't come back down out of that and long term then over a number of years that's going to be all your classic 
stress symptoms you know the heart disease and stroke and uh all of that so in other words or if i could better uh just tell me if i got it right um to the effect of someone uh seeking mental clarity or seeking uh an ability to to some degree control their presence through an action or an experience they double down on focus they give themselves whether it's a sub a supplement or some environment or just behavioral profile that makes it so it's easier for them to self-stimulate uh, over time that starts to impress upon them that the only way for them to focus is to leverage that kind of deficit and as a byproduct they kind of condition themselves to live in a state that preconditions that focus before anything else so it's like a we know that this is how we focus. We know that these are some circumstances wherein if we're not, fo or, uh, if we're focused, we're going to have these kind of things at play. And so people justify not only doubling down on that, that energy uh, expenditure, but making sure that they feel a certain way to qualify that they are focused, like uh, their heart rate's high enough, or there's enough stress demand on the environment such that they're like, this is comfortable. This is the amount of stress I like. Uh, would you say that by way of living like that, people don't even know what's good for them or what's not good for them at, at that point? It's kind of just like what allows them to get through the day without feeling like they have to make new decisions. Rather, they make familiar decisions and they're like, that means that I did it well, as opposed to I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, kind of like I think the uh, I, I think it's one of those things where we get it wrong a lot of the time as well, where you take something like ADHD and go like, Oh, this is, this means that you're bad at focusing. So, so then you take that to mean, Oh, I should be able to focus all the time. Um, and so I think a lot of the time people take just the wrong message from, from those kind of things where we think focus is good. Not being focused is bad. So therefore always being focused is good. Um, and we should, we should always try to, get rid of the other one and if that was true then actually yeah why wouldn't you just take some some kind of external thing to to make you be able to do it but it's uh it becomes more ridiculous when you think of like uh i guess again going back to the physical analogy uh grip strength is probably really good like if you if you can um pull like 60 80 kilos or, or something on, on a dynamometer uh that's probably pretty good but if you could only do that that wouldn't be great like if you're picking up a glass and you just crush it instantly because uh you're like no grip is good i don't care like I, i'm just gonna <laughs> grip at the maximum strength every single time i i do every everything that would that would never work so um I guess it's that thing of like the awareness that yeah, being able to focus uh, is really really good, but also you need to be able to do it the other way. Uh, in the ADHD community, a lot of people get really confused about this kind of thing as well, where they go like, oh, maybe I maybe I don't have it because actually sometimes I can focus really really well, and then and actually my problem is that I'm not able to stop focusing. Um, and, it, and it's that thing of again well yeah that's that's why we don't need to it's not necessarily focus itself it's the all the things around it that we need to figure out how how can we be better at those because when we need to focus our our brain and body will start to adopt certain things certain postures certain uh breathing patterns certain uh you know our, our our blood pressure our heart rate goes in in certain ways uh and then when we want to stop also you know the reverse tends to usually happen so then we start to calm down a little bit more and uh and be a little bit more chilled out and yeah that if we had more control over the the physical side of things we might find that focus is something that we can utilize when we want to and when we need to stop and actually relax then we would be able to do that as as well rather than relying on an external aid that uh you know an energy drink or or in the case of the medications it's like oh well this is probably going to last 12 hours so uh you know if if um 
if you need a significant rest period or anything, then uh, then maybe that's that's uh, going to be a problem. Where do you tend to start with people? I mean, I imagine there's kind of a bit of an assessment to see like, okay, where, how severe is it? Like, are you super squirrely throughout all your activities versus, okay, I, you can focus on certain things pretty well, but then, then there's other tasks. Like, I imagine one, there's kind of an assessment process that you would take somebody through and then based off of that, what are some like common first steps to, to kind of start to restore some balance there? Yeah. So, I mean, with the stuff that we're doing with the, with uh, practical wisdom, that's uh, a lot more group coaching. So we're just trying to teach them about the ideas, but when we do the, when we do work with people uh, one-to-one, the big things that I find in the assessment. So the, eyes are going to be a really big part because um your visual system uses up so much fuel and focus because focus comes from the frontal lobe of the brain anytime there's a fuel shortage you can guarantee that uh all of the frontal lobe tasks are just not going to get done so if we're if we're lacking in fuel what does that look like if if you have difficulty with your frontal lobe just for the people that aren't as yeah what would you say that looks like for someone who's just struggling with processing? Yeah. So frontal lobe of the brain, you can think of as the stuff that we think of as like human tasks. So like decision-making, uh, focusing on things, ignoring distractions, uh, saying no to things. So like when you walk past uh, the chicken shop and you're like, oh man, I could get some fried chicken right now. And that bit of your brain that goes, yeah, but you probably shouldn't do that. Yeah. So, so say, and saying no to a lot of things. So pretty much at all times when you're awake, your body is trying to do a whole bunch of things. Like there's, there's loads of reflexes that you have and, you know, uh, loads of things going on where, uh, you know, let's say I swing my, I lift up my left hip and then there'll be a signal goes to my brain that says, Hey, my right arm just wants to lift up. Is that okay? And, uh, then yeah, your frontal lobe is going to say, nah, don't do that. We're, we're not walking right now. So, so we're good. Um, so it's, it's active all of the time, but the less necessary processes as we lose energy are, are going to start to die off. So being able to focus on things is important but not that important if we want to survive uh being able to say no to our impulses again not that important if we want to survive uh so you usually see those two things um die off pretty quick uh and so the visual system being the system that tends to use up the most energy is the very first thing i'd want to check and then the second thing i would definitely want to check is going to be people's breathing um because obviously that's going to affect how quickly you can get the fuel up to the brain in the first place. Uh, and then after that, usually other things that the frontal lobe does is uh, voluntary movement. So I would usually ask people to perform like complicated movement tasks and just see how well they, they manage the instructions and things like that. Uh, isometric exercises and stuff. If they find that they can't really hold a squat for more than five seconds without it just feeling agonizing and uh you know all the negative thoughts creeping into their head uh that would be an, uh, another indicator so uh those would usually be the the first things that i'd look at and then the other secondary thing would be the vestibular system uh the balance system of the body just because anytime that your brain thinks that you're losing your balance uh it's going to again use a lot of energy to sort sort out that problem uh, i have and, one point uh, if you yeah. don't mind. uh so i was just talking to a couple of people about feet and there's a there's a camp uh that really talks there's a number of camps that really talk this but uh someone had said that hand-eye coordination is uh not produced by but largely led by the contact of feet on the ground and i mean fundamentally that's just like a a very weird correlative when it's called hand-eye coordination so I was like arguing with some people on Instagram, but to the effect of when you lose out on on focus, where does your brain go to accrue that focus if it can't tangibly manifest like higher order functions or higher order thoughts? Uh, I'm I'm leading this toward the homunculus, but I'm asking you relative, like what what would you say is like? 
do you see people being predisposed to like gripping with their feet a lot more, gripping with their hands a lot more, even if there's nothing to grip on? Do you feel them like almost gripping with their eyes or like tangibly trying to manifest stability through things that if you, they were to see their, if their high order f functions were to see how they're uh, like correlating these two things, they'll see you're kind of like wishfully trying to accrue like uh, dopamine from a pairing of where you're at deficit but not at all finding stability through the effort. You're just finding more sensation. You're just finding more like for that part of the brain, more light. Yeah. Okay. So for a start, that is really interesting about the, the hands and feet. Um, I would really like to know more about that actually at some, at some point, but, uh, but um, it, like in some senses, it makes sense because there's, uh, certain parts of your brain that deal specifically with the hands and feet and a lot of the time you do see the uh the opposing joints from upper to lower working a lot in tandem so you know when you when you swing your right arm your forwards your left leg always swings forwards and so the hip and the the hip and the shoulder tend to have a lot of reflexes that that work together the elbow and the knee uh, and by the same uh, virtue, the the hands and the feet also have a lot of strong connections. Uh, and then where it might also lead into the second bit of what you were saying, the hands in particular, and I wish I had looked up a bit more about this because I, be I believe the feet maybe as well, but I can't say for sure. Um, in the back part of your brain called the cerebellum, which is like this big coordination center, uh it's its job is when you're doing movement you know i say i'm going to lift my arm up like this uh you start the movement and then the cerebellum kind of says oh left a bit right a bit up a bit uh to make sure that you get to the right spot so it makes sure all of your movements are very smooth and coordinated uh, and one of the cool things about it is it also does the same thing about your thoughts so if i'm having a thought the cerebellum's job is to make sure I start the thought in the right place and that I go in a straight line and actually get to the finish of the thought uh, in a nice way, uh, rather than going off on several different tangents or looping back around to uh, the same spot over and over again, like that kind of rumination type thing. Um, so when you're mentioning the homunculus, the cerebellum has its own homunculus as well that uh, links the hands very similarly to that bit that does like smooth and coordinated thought. And so when you're struggling to focus, if your frontal lobe is saying, I need more, more fuel here and I need more oxygen here, then one of the things it's going to do is say, all right, well, I can't really control these imaginary thoughts very well because that's like several layers back of this weird complex advanced movement system but i can control the hands so if i just put loads of tension or pressure in the hands or or you know start fidgeting or or something like that um then the motor cortex in the frontal lobe and this little bit of the cerebellum is going to get more more blood flow going to those areas uh, and if those if those areas near the bit that controls the thought are full of blood already, then uh, it becomes easier to to just knock it over the fence into the uh, into the thought part. So yeah, you will you will a lot of the time see when people are struggling with focus, um, potentially playing with their hands, potentially uh, tensing up. Um, again, because we don't get to see so many people bare feet. Uh, I'd be really interested to see actually, yeah, how much of it also translate into feet because we know with with stress and things uh, that can affect things like um, your your big toe and it can suddenly become more likely to to try and lift a little off the ground to to make it easier for you to kind of run and change direction. But uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting to know if also for for things like your thoughts, uh, you know, I have seen in uh acrobatics classes that i've run when people are struggling with with certain things then you see their feet starting to twitch and move and, and things like that so so might not be so dissimilar so it's almost like their hands are trying to tangibly take a grip or stabilize the part of their brain that they can't uh coordinate or uh, manage like oriented thought through like 
I want to do this, uh, but uh, whether it's like the motivation to do it's not met by enough dopamine or there's not enough tangible energy to actually like ride that that effort train, uh, then instead of <clears throat> the deep breath, instead of calming, instead of like give, giving a clear thought to the process, their hands are almost like grabbing their their skeleton and giving themselves kind of the same indicative uh like it's kind of like inverting the map right so you have your hands and similar to like if you ever played like a flight simulator if you go up the thing goes down if you go down the thing goes up yeah or like almost like backwards trying to like like uh operator on our head or operation on our head and at the end of the day, the same effort in our hands is what's making our head go to that deficit or it's making our spine go to that deficit or like the way I see it more often than not is because the thumb is so tight, uh, tightly t uh, tied to the clavicle, majority of issues that people see in their spine are a byproduct of the thumb. So like if we if we inhibit there being enough uh, uh like ulnar activation and we're effectively stuck in radial tension like the ability to internally rotate mm -hmm. is coming from this uh radial side or the uh yeah the radial side of the hand and so there's actual uh, uh tissue that's more prone to twisting in that that inside of the hand which is why most of us have a collapsed foot or some degree of like big toe heaviness because the foot itself isn't a thing being touched on the ground anymore it's the thumb or the hand uh, it's the thumb instead of the the whole of the foot so we've done the same thing both ways and because of that correction our hips or our shoulders have hiked up or they've drawn into a different position to allow for the lack of variability in the the hand so we've taken the whole chain of the arm and leg and lifted them and then the rib cage is now stuck in a position where it has to abide the mechanics of the arm that are not driven by the spine if they're driven by this pairing so people have taken or they've like deconstructed their their relationship with all the homunculus or deconstructed individual parts and they're like these are the things i can recall on immediately and because my system's so far into stress and i don't know it each effort i make is kind of exacerbating that that relationship or that dependency and so now i'm stuck here now i now i have no map for what it was before because and the amount of depended on this has taken this structure and lifted it forward and this structure and pushed it down. And then now my head and jaw are kind of like, I'm being pulled in two different directions. I don't even know I have headaches all the time. I don't even know I'm light sick. And the degree of damage that everyone's walking around in is their own doing. They're literally choking themselves in their own hands, in their own feet, in their own groins. And they don't know. Yeah, and it's interesting that you said reverse engineered because that's something I do think about a lot in terms of the hands and the brain in terms of, you know, I guess now that we're starting to think more and more about the all of the stuff that we used to think was just separate. There's like physical stuff and then there's psychological stuff. And in the last 10, 20 years, we're starting to go like, oh no, actually they're both exactly the same thing. And when you look around for it, usually that's as far as people go. It's just like, oh yeah, we're finding that they're both connected. You know, exercise, is help exercise helps your mental health. Uh, the way that you think can influence your posture potentially. Um, and for me, I'm like, yeah, but tell me why, tell me why I need to, I need to know, know this. And uh, there's not that many people going, a whole lot deeper yet but some of the the theories around like complex thoughts seem to just be basically we never would have been able to have thoughts until we could do complicated things like the the brain that we have isn't possible to to exist until we were able to do something complicated enough to uh to merit that and um so so the fact that you know we've got hands that that can do really complicated things mean that now we had to evolve a brain that that was like oh i wonder what would happen if we did this better not try it because like i better think about it first and uh that idea of being able to think about something three steps ahead maybe wouldn't have ever come there unless uh we were actually able to to set something up have it fail and then try again um several several times over and so yeah when it comes comes to the hands actually we think that we're trying to improve or or 
or thoughts, but the reason we have thoughts is because we have hand movement. And so when our brain tries to put that tension in to get more, more oxygen up to the, to the thinking bit, um, that works temporarily, but then you're stuck with hands that don't really move. And, uh, then your brain starts going, ah, oh, well, actually I'm going to start reacting to my physical circumstances. And then you find your quality of thoughts start to start to diminish because uh, you don't move well enough to to need to think about as many things as you you once were able to, let's say. So um, yeah, it is kind of just reverse engineering actually. If you uh, you improve the movement of your thumb, it might affect your spine for similar reasons. But then also, uh, yeah, the the thoughts that you're able to have, the clarity of your thoughts, your ability to to think of multiple things at once project into the distance in the future um looks like it actually is going to be affected by your physical capacity for for movement and and very much so uh by what your hands are capable of doing which also is dictated by what the rest of your body is able to do you know you can only you can pick up a ball and throw it but that still requires uh your spine and your feet and your knees and everything to to work in a chain it's an interesting uh, place to be in uh, for someone to not know how far gone they are, but to think uh, if we take into account every single person is always the driver of their bus, like they're they're driving their vehicle no matter what, they're fueling their vehicle, they're doing all the things, and the the degree to which that's doing it or it's being done reflexively or to the degree that our human body can do it is in the opposite how much space they have to be open to new things or how much space they have to learn uh, or just be present. And a lot of people overqualify. There's a need to increase focus, to increase presence. But if presence is a non-tangible, it's, it's like a, an allowance for information to come in and you don't really have like a, a fixed relationship with it, you're just learning or listening or whatever, then the fundamental that most so many people are going for is the fundamental that is causing their stress. Like the the nature of chasing this fixation or chasing this this sensory coordination or this fit if i mean everything is sensory you're feeling your your own thoughts to a degree you're paying attention to how your eyes are moving around the thoughts or you're paying attention to how you're breathing around the everything is to a degree driven by that sensory like i feel good where i'm at or i feel good how i'm being now if we drive everything from a where I'm at, not where I could be, then everyone is effectively re realizing that, okay, this is what I have available to me right now. Not uh, if I were to work in these pathways, not as hard as I can, but uh, giving to these things that kind of need to upregulate or downregulate, then I could very well have a bigger expenditure of energy allowed me, but I may not be in the <gasps> mode that I usually go into things. I think just talking about how so many people are like, I like this system, I would like to do this, I need to learn this, my doctor tells me to do this, or I know I need to work on this. The, the lack of familiarity people really have with what they need is fundamentally just because they can't feel their body outside of what they expect to feel. Like there's a degree of my day is going to go like this, my body is able to do these things, I'm going to drive myself through these obstacles, no more, no less. And I'm going to give myself only the credit where I know I can give myself credit. There's going to be no trying into this this realm. Or if there's trying here, I know I'm going to do it bad or I know I'm not going to do it different. So we're just going to like uh, not attribute any any value there. And because people treat their world the same way that their brain kind of innocuously says, hey, we can't do this. We're not going to pay attention to it. There's a degree of people no longer feeling significant in their own fucking bodies. And so this shit makes them feel tangible instead of what does this mean for me what am i doing here and if they just found that that small modicum of stability instead of gripping like that or instead of taking all their brain and being like ah, they may very well have a couple of breaths that are nicer than they've ever had and i think more so you guys and s10 and the people that do z health or a variety of different like integrated neurological we're focusing on something no one can really explain unless you feel it or you, unless you have a backing in the education, you guys are really going through the process of helping people discern or figure out the path of uh, committing or catching in their breath. And it's it's just not something done by standard training. It's just not something where you, you look at someone who's doing 
biomechanics and they're claiming, oh, we're doing the thing that's important, but you're literally doing the thing based off of how the brain associates. The biomechanics wouldn't exist unless the paired relationship were matured and re reflexive over time. And taking advantage of the reflex is just saying like, hey, we have it. We might as well use it instead of making it better or learning how to refine it. And uh, it, just to say like, everyone's chasing the, the car. They're a dog running into the street chasing a car when in their house, their family and all the people they know are right there. And they could have the experience and the encounters that they want. But the fact is they keep chasing that fucking car that distracts them instead of just going back in the house and be like, all right, what do I have that I'm looking for and would like right now? <laughs> yeah, I think it's scary the amount of stuff like uh... It's the same thing of even then when you see like all the billionaires go into space and you're like, oh man, but even like the ocean, even just land, like we haven't seen everything yet. And there's there's more stuff if you wanna if you wanna look for it. Uh one, but yeah, the, I think the scary thing with when we chase so many of those those other things, and actually the thing to realize with your brain is that about 95 percent of everything that's going on you're not actually aware of like that and that's for everybody that's whether you're super trained uh into you know being able to feel all of your senses uh extra well or you just coast through life like it's still the ratio works out about 90 to 95 percent of all the stuff that's going on in your brain is happening completely unconsciously uh you know people get weirded out by visual illusions well that's just because we cannot see those it's impossible for us to see those illusions how they really are because when light enters our eyes we don't ever get to see what the world really looks like the light goes in and then the brain does <laughs> you know uh a good solid bit of photoshopping and then after that uh we we get to see what it presents to us um but then on the other side of that what happens when your cognitive function declines or your cognitive function changes but because so much is going on unconsciously, you're not actually aware of it. So, uh, you know, loads of people go, oh, yeah, I used to be faster when I was younger. And it's like, well, why was that? Um, like, was it where you think was it just your body moved faster? It probably wasn't because your body won't will only move as fast as your brain can think. So if that's the case, where is your brain just thinking faster? And if that's the case, why can't you just think faster now? Like what's, what's stopping you from doing that? Where, where's the, what's the process? And um, yeah, if you're always like, Oh no, the, the stuff I need is going to come from, from somewhere on the outside. Uh, you can miss out on a lot of that. Like just figuring out like, yeah, what part of my thought process? Is it that I don't see things quickly enough? Is it that I do see things quickly enough and then just some weird stuff happens in the interim from it going, you know, from my eyes to my hands? Um, and if it is somewhere in the middle, then how can I break that down? Is it that, uh, you know, let's say I'm trying to catch a ball. Uh, it could be that my eyes see I need to catch the ball. They tell my arm it needs to catch the ball. But when my arm goes to reach up, that makes me too heavy on this side and I'm going to start to fall. So so maybe it's a balance problem. Or uh, if I'm going to start moving really quickly to, to catch the ball, actually my blood pressure needs to change because if, uh, if I'm going to be doing more motion, then uh, my blood pressure is going to rise a little bit so then my my body might need to widen the blood vessels to to drop it back down or something like that uh there's infinite possibilities of of where this could be going wrong uh but we usually just write it off as oh yeah i just don't think as fast as i used to so that's why i can't catch the ball um but yeah there's i don't know i, I find it really cool and fascinating and and interesting to nerd out on and uh I think most of the time when people realize that it's a possibility that they could get something back, then it does become fascinating. Like once, once you get a thought process back that you realize you had lost or, or when you start to experience the world a bit more than, than you, you were previously, then you start going like, Oh, hang on. There's a lot of stuff I need to, I need to know right now. Whereas uh, yeah, if you, if you only ever experience it on the decline, 
you just don't notice because that's how your brain works best. It, it it figures out how to make you fine with it, um, so that so that you can keep going on. You think that there's a fundamental connection between the expressive side of the human mind, which is like the limbic uh, emotions and the presentation of how someone feels versus their ability to use words. So like in the same way, if they don't know that they're experiencing a depreciation of access and they're just experiencing their brain as they experience it, then maybe they'll overlook that change and that change doesn't become like a, a, a clear um, deliverable for them. Uh, but do you think that's also to the effect of like words help construct ideas and concepts or they like kind of hold uh, words in boxes or like ideas in boxes as a byproduct of I know these words, I know what they're meant to mean, I know how they're going to be received. Okay, I'm putting that to the connotative experience or expression around that word in my head. Do you think that in the same way that uh, when people have injuries uh, and when they're injured, they're like, I can't move there? If they don't know or can't picture a meaning of a word or meaning of an experience outside of how they perceived it, they may close down their ability to learn around that uh, that experience. I'd say probably, um, and I think in terms of in terms of words, that's probably why stuff like art is so important because. Uh, you probably never reach with just words on their own again because we didn't start as 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 thinking beings we started as moving beings and the thinking just helps helps the moving um i think we'll never really be able to come up with a exact word that's going to match every every single thing that we experience um because the word is like guess the same as that like photoshop process it's like several layers removed from the actual thing so uh physical art especially like some sort of physical expression like uh movement or dance or or you know even more structured ones like martial arts and things where there are rules but you're still you're still working through them to to move in different ways uh i think that kind of thing also is really important for your language because then you start to experience more things that you uh suddenly realize you need a word for um uh and things like that and then on the physical side of it then yeah it's got to be the same like uh there's i've heard a lot of people talking recently because ai is becoming this huge big thing of like oh one day do you think there'll be the option to download your brain into a computer and would you do it and I find that quite weird because I just I can't comprehend what my brain in a computer would be like because the think of like what what kind of mood are you in right now is based on how well you can move like yeah. if uh, if I wrapped you in in cling film you would and change none of your other circumstances you're still sitting out in the sun there's still a dog running around you you'd still be a bit more pissed off. Like not even if it was a, you consented to it, <laughs> um, you you'd still be like, ah, cool. Okay. Well, I'm still slightly more anxious because something could just come and land on me, uh, try and eat me. Uh, you know, if, if I become uncomfortable, I'm not going to be able to move. Uh, so when I, when I restrict your ability to, to move, I influence the limit, like, the, the range of possible thoughts and emotions that you can be currently having having uh, and you know you can if you will it hard enough you can push it and and branch it out a little bit but i do think there's always going to be limits so um you know uh when you change your change how you're able to how you're able to move it's very often going to change the way that that you think and then yeah if it, if you went full on into like now you're just a stationary computer i don't know what that that would look like um i guess the closest we we ever get to see is in things like uh motor neurons disease where where people talk about uh they're able to talk about the decline in movement um but that one's interesting as well because it's it's uh you still you still get to keep all the all the sensory side of things 
Um, but usually, you know, the less well you move, then also the sensation diminishes as well. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, you go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just like very fascinating uh, to bring it back to kind of like the the hands, their relationship to the thoughts and, and our words and how we even talk with our hands, how it seems like it's easier to follow somebody's thought patterns when you're watching them and they're expressive with their hands and especially you james i noticed just like the way that your your hands are going all over the place like your your brains operate at a pretty quick rate and kind of like the the way even you you use the word photoshop and you did it you did this kind of thing where your hands went like doo, 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 to kind of convey the the layers and kind of the visual that you're seeing and that's yeah very fascinating and it's i don't know if that's something you notice um in people when they don't have as as good of a way with words where you tend to notice a little bit less of that like hand motion associated with it um i know for myself like one of the times where i'll feel my most focused is when i'm like drumming and there's like a, a very clear relationship between like the rhythm of my hands along with like the just the experience of my my body. I imagine that's something that if somebody's struggling with focus, just like getting a bongo drum and just like jamming out for five minutes, they'll probably feel better after the fact. Um, but you kind of like, yeah, I guess you're kind of saying like, if somebody's really struggling with their thought patterns and in their ability to convey themselves, that potentially freeing up their hands could be a way to to help foster that connection i'm trying to be really expressive with my hands. yeah <laughs> yeah and that could come down with like the thing i was saying about art as well of like when you think a thought and then you try to build it uh, um it becomes easier for you to explain what you're doing the same as you know when you learn how to juggle uh when you're trying to teach somebody else then you start understanding juggling a little bit better and uh yeah when you try to to draw the picture or or when you try to act out what you're what you're thinking your brain engages on an additional level to be like oh what am i actually thinking and uh you know i might have had a word in mind that i wanted to say there but then when i did this and uh, i did this with my arms it made me think oh no it's it's that word's not wide enough and who knows what that means but but that one word i was thinking of just isn't wide enough so i need a wider word and and i'll go go to think about that um i find i do find when you when you take the people who are really insecure about their their voice and they say that they they you know they think that they're really boring when they talk or or unexpressive when you actually watch them talk a, a lot of the time either again you'll see the the more the tension the involuntary kind of hand movements or just total totally stationary i don't know wh which one's causing the other but then when you look at um like all the politicians and things like that where you know they get super trained into being as visual as possible and as ex expressive as possible and uh they're really great at you know they they've got all the hand movements uh trained and, and precise and so when you watch them you understand what they're talking about you understand what they're talking about even if the volume was was off uh the words that they're saying they all all the best politicians uh use really visual imagery as well like all the slogans have to have something that you can physically imagine um in real life and uh i think it's it's all super linked so yeah probably with 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 the hands i think it definitely the more you can start using them even if at the start it just feels like they're not doing what you you want them to uh with practice actually you might find it helps you think of your word choice quicker and easier i think there's a big misfortune with the amount of science that's being neglected because most people don't understand how far gone they are in their own brains like a if I were to give an honest assessment, I think most people are pretty stupid compared to what they're capable of. And that's just a byproduct of living and eating stress every day. And it's not even like they're, even if they have a good, healthy, like environment around them, how little that they've been taught or managed to mirror stability, like what people convey that is stable versus what actually is stable is such a different, there's so much in the realm of oh no this person's stable because they're masking here they're showing up here they're showing up here and at the end of the day they're not a person that would mirror 
a stable map that you could otherwise, if you were learning how to be a person like a kid, you could learn from that person how to be stable. You'd learn how to make a bunch of conscious decisions that you don't know the meaning of. But, I mean, you're looking at uh, politicians are a very, very profound one because you see how many of them are unhealthy. So the amount of sensory information that they already are having as an issue, and then you're seeing them like talk and like fake their smiles and shit. And then you're like, Okay, so there's no dopamine in your ability to in your ability to like traverse happiness, but there's dopamine for you to traverse the the artificial happiness, to traverse the focus or like that that social constructive effort where you're telling people to think in in line with what you want. And then you start to see what psychopathy is. You're seeing like how someone can cross coordinate their brain's value system to find appeal or benefit from things that are fundamentally antisocial which means that they're anti-human. And then you're seeing people who are like, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But you know that they're doing it with a cognizant world with all of it. Some people are going to suffer. Some people that are just like them uh, are going to have very little opportunity to do this or this or this. At the end of the day, we're seeing people who have chosen because they have sensory issues, because they have mental issues, because they have physical issues, to qualify their reality as being standardized from that level or that that low vibration, so to speak. And you can never tell someone who's justifying their experience that they're living in shit if they don't see it as shit, if they see it as a thing that's getting them through the day. So I think the fundamental thing that's a difficulty for everyone is that because everyone's living in shit, because no one knows how to take themselves individually out of it, they can only see how someone else is living in it. Everyone is in the point of, I'm making it work. You're doing a worse job of it. You should mirror me. And then there's this quality of like, I'm not going to mirror you. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's figuring it out. And so everyone's walking around grunting at each other being like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And everyone is just like the same pile of shit as far as like when they look in the mirror, they're seeing uh, like their inverted stress monster self, but they're not seeing what they could be, which is a stable partner, stable uh, educator, stable mentor, someone who when they get into an extreme environment, they have options. They don't feel like their whole body tenses and buckles down. They go tunnel vision. Their heart rate is the only thing they can hear in their ears aside from sirens and tinnitus. Like there should be a degree of it, like a dog. You'll see a dog sh like get shocked by thunder or like a, an alarm system or something like that. Your high order processes allow for you to give a little bit of space between impulse reaction and what just happened. And because so many people live in that impulse reaction, but they don't ever develop what just happened, they ignore it. And so that nature of just hearing fucking ambulatory noises or things that are like animals dying in the background is normal for people, but they ignore it. So anyone would be stressed. Anyone would have a difficulty connecting with a new person or smiling for real or breathing for real or like <clears throat> it's kind of a random one. But the nature by which uh women have difficulty mating with a partner or finding themselves like intimately comfortable or like the ability for women to like find a sensory easement in partnered relations and like the amount of people women who just don't have a connection to their they're more like uh, in their when they're intimate sensation is something that they have to think about or sensation is something that they have to like some way coordinate and i think fundamentally this is the same thing that if you find your value from all these things that are not you living in your life, you're going to probably disassociate from those things that might be the farther end of value and just stay in your little bubble. So where men might be like beating their chest, like running into things and enjoying a, a fleeting moment of, yeah, good job, good job. Uh, in the same, there's not a degree of like uh, vested interest in feeling what it's like to be uh, not the bull running, but the bull laying down and chilling. Like uh, not every creature that's designed to be intense has to live in intensity. And I think that there's so many things that women and men are trying to like, no, I need to be this pretty thing. I need to be this intense thing. or I need to be this powerful thing. And they just self-isolate in behaviors that make it so that because you think of yourself as other and you don't see the similarity, even if it's a male, even if it's a female and you're, and you're not that, we're all people. We all have the same correlative, like, my hands want to move to help me move. My heart is, I can hear it in my ears sometimes. I can hear it in my stomach. Or I can feel it in my stomach sometimes. There's degrees of like weird things we all share to the effect of to make the puppet move, the puppet needs to 
self coordinate and more often than not, people are like, I don't even know how to do these moves. So I'm going to stay in this, in this puppet zone instead of let's figure out how to whimsically walk around and shit. Yeah. Um, and I, oh man, there was a, as quite a lot in that actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was going to say with the, with the mirroring thing that you were talking about with the, with people with each other, but I find it also interesting in that for politicians to go back to them a lot of the time, whoever you're choosing as like the kind of figurehead person kind of has like to see a, a super healthy politician. If the population actually isn't super healthy themselves, um, actually might not work because the the people voting for that person actually need to see uh, some kind of a reflection of them and it might be the physical it might be something else but there's there's going to be an element of that uh, and part of the reason that it's engineered is is they're trying to figure out well what is the bit that we're gonna we're gonna mirror back to everybody um so yeah. So yeah, there's there's stuff around that, and then I guess also on the other side of it, like how much of it do we just write off because we took it for granted as soon as we were we were born? Like uh, picking heavy stuff up is the big one. You see all the faces where, uh, and like, why do you make that face? I guarantee you did you didn't genetically inherit a face that goes all weird when you try to pick up something heavy you just saw your parents do it and then you go oh cool that's that's the i picked up something heavy and that lets everyone around me know that i'm doing something that is <laughs> is difficult uh so that they might either they're going to be impressed by me or they might need to be around in case i need help afterwards um and and yeah there's just a, a lot of that is is the uh we have all of these things that we need just to be act as like social cues um to to other people uh but then we take it for granted as like that's what has to be happening and and it maybe doesn't yeah like we recognize it as our personality because we're not only watching the world around us but we're also watching ourselves even though we don't know we're watching ourselves like the yeah yeah i think the I say this a lot, and this is said in the book that we have, uh, which is selfish is the first step to selfless. I mean, the root word of both those words is self, and the more that someone can ascertain what's going on in their own environment, the more they'll be able to either relay it inward or relay it outward. But for the fundamental of being able to like coordinate your own wants and will, you have to socialize with yourself. You have to know... Uh, who you are and how you are yeah um and that's that's the other part of it is like there's there's stuff that you can you can take on socially with everybody else but uh that only works if you understand yourself really well uh, as well otherwise you like if you imagine it just as like a wave of people you're just you're just going to get caught up in the wave and you're going to have no choice to go the way everybody else is going unless you understand the where the separation is like uh how you fit in with everybody else and how you actually um how you fit in in a unique way as well as in a in a conforming way i guess right yeah okay i know you gotta take off here james so thanks for coming by it was cool to chat about focus and all the the branches we uh we went off on there um i guess again you guys aren't really like running your own membership site or anything um uh, do you have somewhere you want to send people to check out the stuff you're doing yeah so f find us on our instagram we we're not doing the membership but we're doing the same kinds of sessions so uh myself or gareth if uh, you're interested in doing some work just uh send us a message on rewire underscore npt and um yeah we can we can take things from there we we're posting uh there and on youtube as well so so we got uh rewire neuro performance therapy on youtube for uh the video content sweet cool man well thanks for coming on we'll have to, to cool chat. yeah
There's much thanks more. For, thanks for having me. This was uh, quite eight fun. Things I could have touched on that we didn't get to today. So we'll have to, we'll have to hit another oh, one. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely. Yeah, it was great having you, dude. Thank you for coming on. It was good seeing you. Sure, yeah, you too. All right, I shall see you later. See you, man. Have a great night.